I was working on my Mike Flanagan movie ranking video, and when you search Mike Flanagan on Netflix, you get his shows. Then, for some reason, in the middle of the list, before his movies, you get this little guy. Look at him down there, all cute. I know the search doesn't strictly show Flanagan stuff, it shows other similar things you might be interested in, or whatever, but look, it's all Flanagan stuff on the top row, and then this shows up, and then it goes to a Flanagan movie, and then Crimson Peak, and then Flanagan's last thing Netflix has, then some other related stuff. Why does this show interrupt? Probably because Netflix knows this is another horror-themed TV show, and that's what Flanagan show watchers like, right? Okay, well, it worked on me. I decided to watch it. I've been in a rankings mode lately, and this has eight episodes. A solid number. This started as some loose thoughts about the episode as I watched and transitioned into more substantive critique at some point. What I have to say about episode 1, for example, is pretty short here. Uh, that's mostly thanks to it being just so cookie-cutter and boring that it didn't really fuel me to speak on it. I spoil kind of indiscriminately in this video. The spoiler-free version is don't waste your time. Except episode 8 is really solid, so you can watch that. Uh, they aren't connected, and you miss nothing for skipping 1 through 7 as far as context for episode 8 goes. Alright, so... Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, episode 1, titled Lot 36. It's fine. The monster visual design was cool, but the audio design was generic monster moans and screams. This is supposed to be someone's long-dead sister possessed by some tentacled demon, and it didn't even have, like, a feminine scream or anything. The setting, the storage unit itself and the building attached, had very little in the way of character to it. It looked a bit run down, but mostly it just needed to be explained as old and not up to code so that it could have only one entrance-exit hybrid door for plot reasons. Our protagonist was unlikable, on purpose. A veteran, moderately racist, and just all-around short-tempered rude guy. Not because the show had anything to say, just because it felt like doing that. I'm in his nose right now. There is a human antagonist as well, and not a monster, who ultimately murders our protagonist. What he did didn't at all justify murder, so she's made similarly vile as a human, weirdly. I guess we aren't supposed to like any of them? That's fine. Anyhow, it ends with our main guy dying, and that's kinda it. A serviceable is the word that comes to mind. It functions and doesn't do anything poorly or excellently, so it just exists. Episode 2, titled Graveyard Rats. This one's also just fine. The premise is a little more interesting than the first one, but with how short these are, they aren't making room for much more than the premise. This time around, we had a couple little twists, though. A giant monster rat roams the tunnels under the graves, and somewhere much farther down, there's a Cthulhu-esque church. This has a rotting body who still clings to life that also chases our main character. Although, that's kind of all there is here. A chase sequence that involves a guy crawling. Nothing here powerfully conveys claustrophobia, and rats aren't scary to me, even the big one. I found myself actually intrigued by the idea of a hidden, long-buried old church to an ancient Lovecraftian deity, though. Unfortunately, that boiled down to another chasing monster that just wasn't a rat. There's an awkward uh, VFX shot where the rotting guy gets kicked away and bounces off a wall that looks pretty rough. Basically, our guy gets stuck and dies in some tunnels. That's about it. So far, both main characters die. The little twist reveal of the church made this one a touch more interesting to me than the first, but I do wish it played a more central role in the short. For now, it goes above episode one. Episode three, The Autopsy. I wasn't expecting a sci-fi action opener to this one, I gotta admit. It's uh, actually got distinct music instead of the generic stuff in the first two episodes. So generic, I didn't even mention it before. There appears to be actual characters here, too. Look, the first two had characters technically, but only just technically. These detectives seem to have some depth. Sci-fi, it turns out, is the direction this one leans. An autopsy is done, and an alien that works like a parasite is revealed. 
It tries to take over our main character, but he outsmarts it, and he gets their conversation on tape, in addition to ensuring his body is dealt with correctly so the alien can't catch anyone else. It's gross and weird and decently clever. First time I'm seeing an alien possession, parasite, autopsy, tables turn, human winds type beat. Easily the best so far, solid couple characters, decent effects, and it feels like thought went into this beyond just the premise. Once again though, our main character died. Episode 4, titled The Outside. This one has the most likable protagonist so far. I genuinely feel bad for what's happening to her in this. Granted, a fair bit of it is her own doing. There's a weird bit where she says that men don't have to care what they look like, which felt kind of out of left field and is completely laughably wrong. But maybe that was just an outburst as the cream is taking over. This is about a skin care gel thing taking over a person, by the way. Our protagonist eventually succumbs to her skin gel obsession and murders her very loving and likable husband. It was okay. The vibe of this one was a sort of corruption of innocence, a fall from grace type of story. It was more sad than scary. That being said, you know, in a horror anthology, when no horror lands, I can't put it all that high. I liked it, but it wasn't scary. It gets points for being likable, but loses some for the lack of horror, so it goes second. Above episode 1 and episode 2, under episode 3. Our protagonist survived, finally, although she kind of turns antagonist by the end, so maybe it doesn't count. All right, time for the first longer one. Episode 5, Pikmin's Model. I'm a few minutes in, and it's as good a time as any to mention the overblown sound effects in this series. Thus far, this series has not been one to shy away from showing grisly detail. Gore is involved in one way or another in each episode and presented flatly on screen. This is just a choice, a tool in the creator's arsenal, and consistently chosen in a way I believe may have been deliberate, although I don't know to what degree the directors collaborated between the episodes. The audio, on the other hand, look, it's also a choice and a tool, just like everything else, but it's really in your face here, or rather your ears, and it's placed in a way I find to be intrusive and unnecessary. In this one, an artist is shown sketching, uh, somebody looks at his sketches, and the things on the paper while we're being shown them make noise? Not in a way like they're coming to life. This isn't a jump scare or anything like that, it's just a calm, conversational sketch viewing, accompanied by growls and monstrous moans, as if the drawings couldn't stand on their own. In this last episode with the skincare ointment, the sound of creamy gel was everywhere. Not in the way like the character was hallucinating it being places that it wasn't, like only when it was on screen, it would very loudly squelch and uh, whatever other onomatopoeias are used for cream. Even if it was on screen with no human, not being used, it would still make this noise. The act of removing an organ from a cadaver in episode 3, no doubt something which makes sound in real life, played a similar noise, and at a similar volume to the dialogue being said by the man that was removing the organ. The lack of subtlety would be one thing, but employing a sound where none should naturally be just feels like a cue to the audience to be scared. It's almost dishonest in a way, like manipulative. You may think maybe these are for kids or teens, they need the audio cue to get it, but we have full-blown nudity here in this series. Like, it didn't shy away from showing dicks on the cadavers in episode 3, or 2, and there's boob in this episode. I don't think it's for kids. Why is this complaint in this episode section? Well, I find this audio issue to be the most egregious here. A drawing presented plainly, followed by more as our character turns the page, truly does not need little scary noises and sounds to play. It's just so unnecessary and rips me right out of the show to think about audio design. Anyway, Crispin Glover is in this and he's putting on an accent that's truly intense. I don't know which accent this is, but he says world as woiled, and work as woik, and through as true. Okay, a bit more time has gone by, and I have to revise what I've said about the audio a little bit. 
apparently, Crispin Glover's character can hear his paintings. He says he hears his dead grandmother's activities, she was some kind of a witch, and he asks our protagonist if he can hear the sounds as well. So, if the audio playing is very much intentional and not designed to be a fourth wall break uh, scare cue sound, okay, but the audio design, uh, I still have issues here. No subtlety is involved. It plays flat into our ears, like it's part of the background music in the show, not in universe. It has no directionality or quiet to it. It's just full blast, centered. It, it plays in both your ears, you know? And our protagonist doesn't react like he can hear them in that first scene until he's prompted with dialogue from Crispin Glover's character. There's no shot of his face looking confused by what he thought he was hearing, no indication he was even hearing anything until a line of dialogue pulled those sounds from the fourth wall and into the show itself. Not in a cool way either, that almost sounds cool. In fact, I'm still not even certain that he did hear anything. He might just be shocked by the horrors he sees in the paintings and Glover's dialogue is merely to sound spooky. I can see this playing out as I believe it is intending to, but much better. A simple shot of a staircase with audio playing like it's coming from downstairs as the dialogue plays would sell this completely, but we get only quick cut close-ups of the painting and audio fed through the same line as the music. If that effect is truly what the show is going for, it's being done poorly. What follows right after me pausing to write that last bit about the audio is a weird breastfeeding hallucination and a creepy mangled witch woman monster thing, so once again, definitely not for kids. That witch thing haunts our protagonist into the next day where he has this horribly awkward thing with his girlfriend's father because the witch is there, so he seems like he's hallucinating and acting weird. And the guy that was doing the breastfeeding and the hallucination is his girlfriend's father. Oh no, and the witch woman is walking around in the background. And Look, we're, we're doing painter goes mad from guy's art and sees the monsters in real life. And his life falls apart. We've seen this. I'll let you know if any subversion happens before it's over, because I'm writing this in the middle of watching. I have to mention that the jump scare sounds have been loud so far. Hopefully those chill out a bit. The relationships between our main character and other characters in this are really confusing and hard to follow. From what we're shown, Crispin Glover's character and our main character should hate each other, but from what we're told in dialogue, they're good friends. What we saw with our main character and his girlfriend and her father at that party thing should have ruined their relationship? Cinematically, it looked like it was ruining their relationship, but then when we fast forward in time, they're together and they have a kid. It's kind of bizarre. Our protagonist uh, hasn't died yet, so let's see where that goes. All right, I'm done with the episode now. Our protagonist survives. Look, haunted paintings are a concept that's interesting enough. When there's nothing more to them than they make people die, it's a bit bland. When the concept is worked more and used to greater effect, I imagine it would work great. I unfortunately haven't seen it used to greater effect. I assume it's been around since shortly after the advent of painting, but it's mostly just used like a ghost. It may as well be a ghost or a demon. The paintings themselves are kind of just generically spooky and that's it. Shame, really. Only other time I think I've seen this concept in a movie was that Velvet Buzzsaw movie and that was a complete disaster. If you've seen this concept done well, please tell me where. I'd love to see it. We're heading into episode 6 now, out of 8. And unless the last three blow me away, this has been very underwhelming. Uh, to the point I almost don't believe our boy Guillermo handpicked these at all, and rather just let his name be tacked on and showed up to record the little intro dialogues. He's been doing little intro dialogues like the Twilight Zone, by the way. There's nothing really to them. Episode 6. Dreams in the Witch House. Guillermo tells us in the little opening monologue that this one's written by H.P. Lovecraft. As much as that's a good sign, adaptations of his work, especially in visual mediums, are difficult. Some are great, 
but often those sway away from the source material in a way that establishes a bit of a curve. The more it strays, the better it is. To some adaptation purists out there, that's a contradiction. But with writings that leave so much work to the reader's imagination, bringing that to a visual space is borderline impossible. It's tough as it is, a red apple, as described, can be any shade of red, and even that I'd be willing to make exceptions for. It could even be blue if you make a good enough case. When it's adapted to a movie, how red is it? For some watching, it's too red. For others, it isn't red enough. Lovecraft's horror taps into the imagination in a way many other authors just don't, and I'm of the opinion that the more successfully personalized that is, the better the adaptation becomes as a result. So long as we're ignoring any other factors anyway, like the overall quality of the work, adaptation arguments aside. All of that to say, even though I like Lovecraft, this could still suck. Into the actual episode now, and we have a young version of our main character. The weird thing is, this main character is played by Rupert Grint, better known as Ron from the Harry Potter movies. He's very much an adult now, so for this scene they cast a redhead kid to play a young version of him. But since we all know what young Rupert Grint looks like, and this kid ain't it, it's distracting. They were confronted with this problem when making it, there's no way they just didn't know. I mean, this has to technically be one of the most famous child actors of all time, right? It's a meta issue here, so it's not fair entirely to blame the showmakers, right? Well, I actually think it is. There's ways this could be avoided, chiefly not hiring Rupert Grint to play a role with a known childhood sequence. Another is to not show the kid's face, only his notable red hair. Three is to skip the young sequence entirely and reform the script to make mentions of events from childhood if need be. You could try and CG machine AI deep learn whatever Ron's face onto this kid, but I think that's probably a bad option because effects quality and ethics. It's strange and distracting and avoidable. That's all. Moving on. There's an editing error in this episode, a scene where Rupert Grint walks into a room and says something which didn't turn out right. The audio doesn't match the visual. He's panting in the audio and then says no words. In the video, he's obviously not panting, and then we see his mouth moves for at least a couple words. Weird to see an error that obvious make it into something that's finished, but let's move on. At least our protagonist is back to dying. Uh, this one's the worst, and it truly sold the maturity level of this project to me and the tone. Hokey, weird, lame, not scary. It's no wonder to me that I didn't hear any buzz around this show when it came out. The most off-putting thing about these is that they feel like they want to be mature. They want to seem grown up, but they lack the maturity in execution. Like a teenager trying to look adult. Comes across kind of pathetic. Nothing here is scary at all, but it sure as hell is trying really, really hard to be. And it seems to think it is. Nothing comes with a wink and a nod, it really believes itself to be mature and scary. In a way that could make something funny, but this isn't funny, it's just sad. So I'm thoroughly convinced at this point that Del Toro had no idea what he was putting his name on. It's just awful. Before this episode, I was thinking about how I'd place the typical points of criticism on a 1 to 10 scale. I was comfortable saying everything here was in the 4 to 6 out of 10 range, very average. Acting, music, cinematography, writing, effects, editing. After this episode, I can't say that anymore. The acting remained fine here, as did the music, but the editing showed some actual no way it went unnoticed by the editor's errors here. Like, they knew it was bad and sent it on anyway. The effects are at a low here even for the painfully average bar that's been set, and the writing hits a new low as well. What I assumed to be some level of gravitas and desire for ambiguity before, I'm now comfortable calling ineptitude. Let's get this over with. Only two to go. Oh god, this one's so painful, man. Episode 7, The Viewing. This one seems to have an actual visual style. Something nice compared to every single other episode's blue-orange color-graded blandness. 
The music seems to be making an effort to fit in with the visuals as well. The dialogue feels similarly douche bro intellectual, though. An unironic adulting or science the shit out of this, I fear, is rapidly approaching. It essentially came. I'm writing this mid-viewing, and I'm not rewinding to get the quote. It was almost worse than my examples. Absolutely some 14-year-old extremely deep, highly intellectual garbage here. When someone calls something pretentious, they're usually tapping into the thing having a perceived level of insight to it, that the thing thinks it's smarter than it actually is. I've heard some things called pretentious that are actually smart, and ironically the one calling the thing pretentious just doesn't get it. They're not smart enough. Not so here. This is pretentious. And unless it pulls a comedy punchline and subverts something here that makes this all a joke, it's going to be incredibly embarrassing. Cringe. Cringe is what happens when you feel secondhand embarrassment or pain. This is cringe. But hey, I'm only 33 minutes in, so who knows? It waits a full 45 minutes to even attempt horror, by the way, in a horror anthology series. Bold choice with strong characters in writing. This doesn't have either of those. I'm done now, and there's no twists. Nothing to say, and despite it oozing with an overwhelming style, nothing to show, either. We've got Ahsoka levels of slowness here with no story attached. I think some of the effects were practical. If that's worth a full hour of intense, pretentious boredom, well, hey, maybe this was made for you. Bear in mind, though, I didn't say the effects were good, just that some of them may have been practical. That's it. Episode 6 was embarrassing. Episode 7 here is embarrassing compared to episode 6, so we've set a new low. Moving swiftly into episode 8, The Murmuring. I'm 16 minutes in, as of the time of writing this, and I think this one actually might be going somewhere. I think this episode trusts us to understand subtext. There's mentions of a trauma, and it's not explicitly outlined what it is. The setting is interesting, like the previous one, but for very different reasons. Weirdly... As of finishing this, it's the best one, by far. I don't have any complaints. This is a bit awkward because it's the last episode, and if Del Toro got handed this script and was told they'd all be of this quality, I see why he'd agree to put his name on it. But if that's what he was told, he was lied to. This is easily the best. I didn't even bother ranking the last ones yet. We'll get there. This is easily the best, but it's made me feel like I need to talk a bit more about the anthology as a whole. Every single thing this series was failing at, the last episode succeeds at. It's kind of amazing that this is even a part of this series, and I genuinely wonder if this was going to be a movie or something, and it couldn't get funding, so they shrunk it down to short film length, and then they couldn't get it distributed without calling in some favors, and so it had to get stuffed into an anthology series. The music blended right in, in the good kind of way. The acting better than was required for any other short in the series, which bears some emphasis here. The acting has all been serviceable, as I mentioned before. By that I mean none of it's distractingly bad, but the script never called for much depth. No actors were pushed by the material to prove that they could really act. The script wasn't going to give anyone their big break, if that makes sense. And this one didn't exactly demand much more either, but a little more than the rest. Bad acting would ruin this. Great acting doesn't really have time to shine, so it's a little complicated. The shots in this one take their time, which is something none of the other episodes seem to have time for, except the previous one, the viewing. But that one made the shots linger way too long with no substance and no purpose. Here, they fit. You want a spooky shot down the hallway to show our character concerned about a sound she heard? Someone tell the director of episode 7 that it doesn't need to last a minute and a half, and tell the directors of every previous episode that it can last longer than one second. Nobody explicitly states what the trauma our characters are dealing with was, which forces us to pay some attention to figure it out. A refreshing change compared to the rest. I'm learning that it's difficult to nail down and describe the maturity of something, but... Good lord, watch episode 6, and then this. Something about the feel. 
what it chooses to spell out and have characters specifically explain, the time it lets things take, it's night and day. The amount of trust it gives the audience from beyond hand-holding to just hints. The monster here, the ghost, is both scary and given subtext that connects it to our protagonist in a way that ties into the trauma, it's actually fairly clever. Nothing too insanely groundbreaking here, but compared to other episodes, it's like Shakespeare. We get an actual character arc out of this too, which is the literal first in the series. So the episode's ranked looks like this. At the top is episode 8, The Murmuring. By far, it isn't even remotely close. Next up is episode 3, The Autopsy. It's a solid little sci-fi gore short with a little to complain about and some okay effects work with decently likable characters and a coherent story. And episode 4, The Outside, a likable core pair of characters, an interesting idea delivered a bit subpar, and an overall sad story executed just fine. Next up is episode 2, Graveyard Rats, an extremely basic premise that doesn't overstay its welcome. This one's runtime is about half the rest of the shorts. A neat little twist in there with the church thing, but nothing special really. Episode 1 is up next. This one sets the tone of mediocre excellently. An okay premise, executed decently, with no real twists or turns along the way, with half-baked characters and ideas throughout, and an okay monster. Next is episode 5, Pikmin's Model. This one reached way too hard and ran way too long with a basic concept that it didn't seem prepared to actually utilize. There's bizarre friendship and relationship dynamics that don't really make very much sense. It's all delivered very incoherently. But the performances are all right, and some of the art is neat. Now we're into the truly awful. Episode 6, Dreams in the Witch House. For an anthology series with nudity, this feels like it was made to frighten six-year-olds. This is on some goosebumps level maturity, whack dialogue approaching parody levels, a story that doesn't make sense, not in a cool Lovecraft way either, and performances probably around the bottom of the series. And last, episode 7, The Viewing. This thing has all of the problems that other episodes in this anthology face, but it really tries to be insightful and deep and cool. This has some Sonic OC levels of cringe and tryharding to it, and absolutely none of it lands. It's harsh. With quality like that, it runs for an embarrassingly long time, shot like it's entirely in slow motion, leaving only its middle school daddy lets me say swear words level of insight to carry it. Slow without a point, desperate to sound cool and smart, and all in service to the weakest horror in the series, which waits 45 full minutes to show up. In some of these, I want to give a bit of credit for at least the ideas present. Boiled down to an idea, this one is a mysterious rich guy invites talented guests to see a crazy eldritch rock he found, and they die. With an Aaron Sorkin or a Tarantino doing the dialogue, maybe. But I genuinely would not be surprised to learn that a very talented 11-year-old wrote this dialogue. One more thing. I can't believe I didn't notice until now. This show is Emmy-nominated for seven Emmys. These are for the main title music, which, sure, it's nice. Cinematography for episode three, the autopsy. Sound editing for episode three as well. Main title design, which, uh, okay. Period costumes and prosthetic makeup for Dreams in the Witch House. There's nothing special about the cinematography in episode three that I noticed, but it wasn't bad or anything, so sure. Sound editing for episode 3? I disagree. Sound editing anywhere near this project is ridiculous to nominate at all. Maybe episode 8 for the bird sounds, but not 3. And makeup and prosthetics and costumes for episode 6? Okay, sure. That stuff was fine, and maybe 2022 was a slow year for makeup. Guillermo del Toro, to my understanding, is a highly respected artist. His movies always play well, at least to critics, and often to general audiences as well. Usually a high bar of quality is attributed to his films. His name gets tossed around a bit for creature designs, something he's known for being excellent with. 
because this anthology has both intelligent, mature, thoughtful, well-constructed horror and immature, poorly crafted trash at the same time, I don't know what to make of it. If this truly got his stamp of approval, episodes 1 to 8, then he's not nearly the genius I thought he was considered. So this cabinet of curiosities has given me a genuine curiosity. What does it mean for something to be Del Toro work? Is my perception of his talent wrong? Well, to better understand, and to get more to the bottom of this little mystery, I figured what better way than to check out his movies. He's been involved in many, but the ones I imagine he would take the most pride in, he both wrote and directed. So I'm going to embark on a journey through all of Mr. Guillermo's movies, starting with Kronos, his first, and then going somewhat randomly throughout all the movies he both wrote and directed. Ranking them being the goal in mind, I suppose, but time will tell. If you enjoyed this little uh, thing, consider subbing to catch the Guillermo del Toro video coming whenever it's done. See ya.